Okay, and finally, we have Johannes Spate uh, talking about combining context and flow-sensitive data flow analyses. Thank you very much for the introduction. So I'm going to speak about context, flow, and field-sensitive data flow analysis using synchronized pushdown systems. I'm Johannes Spät, and this is joint work with Karim Ali and Eric Bodden. So let me briefly motivate. Static data flow analysis is a powerful technique to find software bugs early in the software development process. For instance, think of a Java program where you have a null pointer exception, where you st um, store null in a variable and later on use it. Or a taint analysis that detects, uh, for instance, a SQL injection in, in the code where unsanitized user input flows to a um, SQL statement. Yet another example is a type state analysis that reasons with the object states. And a typical example here is a file handler that should be closed eventually. However, if you then speak of real world software, it's not just one interprocedural data flow anymore, but you have interprocedural data flow. For instance, you can use a method and um, pass objects as arguments into that method and perform, as you see down here, a write call on the argument. And now up here you see two different call sites that use the same variable. However, at each call site, the variable in, within foo is in a different state. So what you need is a context sensitive data flow analysis. Then, because we speak about Java, we also have to handle fields. So you could just store your file into a field, for instance, utils, and then use the field again to load your object and close it. And then you need a field sensitive analysis because you can store um, you can store objects within objects and so on, and you can nest that arbitrarily deep. And that's already the, the point where we enter the space of undecidability because if we have a context sensitive and a field sensitive data flow analysis, it's actually an undecidable problem. And here's why. You can essentially model it as a pushdown automaton with two stacks where the automaton encodes the variables and then you have one stack of call sites and the other and a second stack of fields. Then if you want to compute which variables are alias, you can compute reachability in this automaton. For instance, say, is set an alias of x? But that is already undecidable because you got this stack here. And what many static analysis do is they omit one stack and encode it within the, sta the states of the automaton, for instance, by k-limiting access paths or by access graphs. What happens now is that they actually um, increase the state space of the automaton and make the analysis less efficient and even imprecise because they have to put, they have to put a k-limit on the success path. And I can't exclude myself from that. I've also done that in prior work. And that's what we wanted to overcome in synchronized pushdown systems. Because we thought, can't we model it these two analysis independently in the form of a context-sensitive analysis and a field-sensitive analysis, because then we can just think of each analysis as two independent pushdown systems. And what we call the first one is a pushdown system of calls that just has the call stack, and the second one is just a pushdown system of fields. And then in each pushdown system, we can compute reachability without any limit on k. So we don't need to limit the stack of calls or the stack of fields, well, and then just combine the results. OK, clearly that's an, yet another over-approximation of the actual problem. But I'm going to get back to that later. First, I want to dive more deeply into the pushdown system of calls. So how does that work? Here is another Java program that allocates an object up here and stores it in variable R and then copies it over in S. S is then used up down here to, to be passed into a method. Then you can think of a pushdown system as a graph and that tells you, well, R flows to S. And then there are some special edges, the call sites that actually push elements on the stack, here represented by the actual line number. So for instance, this data flow pushes the, the call site with the number four on the stack. And then there are other rules, the pop rules in this pushdown system that just remove an element from the stack again. And then with this pushdown system, you can answer reachability queries by an algorithm called poststar. And this computes you an automaton that encodes reachability within this graph. 
However, it retains a context-free language reachability. And for instance, you can see that variable r at statement 3 points to our object 01, or s at statement 3 points to our object 01. Equivalently, you can see that t at statement 6 under call stack 4 points to our object 01, as highlighted here. There's something else that I want to highlight here that you have actually foo is a recursive method, and then you have a self loop edge here, and that will reflect to also a loop in the automaton, and then you have a, you represent a recursive pro program in this automaton. Then the pushdown system of fields is similar. However, instead of considering call sites as push rules and return statements as pop rules, it considers field store statements as, as, as pushes, which push the actual field on the stack, and then field load statements as here, they pop then the actual element again. This would be the pushdown system that you would represent in that way. And again, you can compute reachability in form of a, using this post star algorithm that computes you a finite state or an automaton. And this automaton then encodes again C with an epsilon field, meaning an empty field access, um, points to our object 01, or P dot A points to our object 01, and again D points to 01 as well. Then, this automaton can also handle recursive data structures. For instance, think of a linked list. Um, then again, there would be a self-loop edge in the automaton and encodes this recursive data structure. And here's a diff big difference compared to access path that normally always require a limit of k because you need to cut off and over approximate at some point. And if you would model it as, a, as an access path, you have various different abstractions that you have to propagate, and that makes the analysis actually inefficient. To get back to our synchronized pushdown system, so you have the pushdown system of calls and the pushdown system of fields. Both of them are actually flow sensitive. I um, haven't shown that in the presentation, but the details are in the paper. And then only one of them is context sensitive and the other one is field sensitive. What we do is just, well, we compute the acceptance of both automaton and then we have the synchronized pushdown system. Well, of course, where is the over approximation? Because otherwise it wouldn't be decidable. To tackle that, I want to have a different perspective or take a different perspective, namely the perspective of context-free language reachability on that program. On the upper left corner, you see a little program that has several variables and several field stores and uh, field loads down here, and there's one call site. You don't have to understand the details of the program, but you can then think of this program as this graphical representation of it, where the horizontal edges correspond to field store and load, and the vertical edges then correspond to call site and return sites. And then what a synchronized pushdown system can compute is the reachability within this graph. For instance, we could query does um, is, is U reachable from Y or the other way around? Um, and then what the synchronized pushdown system computes is um, it computes the word in the call language, which would be just represented by these two parentheses, and this is a context-free language. That's a word in the context-free language. However, then along the same path, the stores and loads are not properly matched because G, and this, is, this represents the load, is properly matched, but not the load. And therefore, the synchronized pushdown system tells us, well, there isn't a data flow connection between U and Y. And that's exactly where the imprecision happens. So this is exactly the same graph, just extended. And now I want, instead of computing reachable from U, node U, I want to start reachability from node A here. And what happens now is he, the blue path, you see that was the solution uh, that you saw before. There is a second path now in which it's exactly the opposite around, where the, the path does not form a word in the call language, but it does form a word in the field language. What happens now in synchronized pushdown systems, they will tell us, yes, it's reachable. Whereas at runtime, that can't happen. OK, fair enough. That's, a, that's an over-approximation, but we wanted to understand what happens actually in practice. 
And that's why we applied our synchronized pushdown system to two data flow analysis. The first one was a demand-driven pointer analysis that we actually published on in ECOOP 2016, and it was using an access path model. And then we applied it to a typeset analysis that we published in OOPSTAR 2017 that also was using access graph as heap model. And so that's we could perfectly compare here. What we did with Boomerang was we um, actually created benchmark programs that was would force the access path model to um, increase to 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 yield to state explosions. For instance, this program here, as you saw earlier already, that would create an infinite or a, limit, a big size data flow computation. And then we said, well, we can actually increase the state explosion by introducing new fields. For instance, A2 here. Then we would just ex um, create more combinations. So if you analyze this program with an access path limit of one, these are all access paths that you generate. When you then increase the limit to two, you get yet more um, access path because you have more combinations that will appear. Whereas when you analyze the same problem with a program with synchronized pushdown system, you get one field automaton that encodes all these access paths concisely and precisely. And here are the results of the analysis. We actually, um, so we in this program, we increased the number of field accesses, and that's what you see on the x-axis here. And then we, we measured the analysis time. And what we could observe is that, so here is the analysis time when you use a k limit of k equal one. And here is already the analysis time when you use a k limit of two, three, and four. And surprisingly, synchronized pushdown systems are almost as efficient as if you would analyze it with a k limit of one. However, keep in mind that the solution is actually doesn't require any k limit, so it's more precise. And just for the sake of, um, yeah, so, so we also observed actually the access path limit of 13 on real world programs, so it's not something that we made up, but on Eclipse we really observed that there would be really long chains of access path that would be generated. The second application was then the type state analysis that we um, used the synchronized pushdown system for, and actually what you can do is you can lift one of the pushdown system to a, what's called a weighted pushdown system, and then you can form a type set analysis. So with this weighted pushdown system, you, what you need is a type state, uh, an automaton that encodes the usage pattern of your API, and then you assign to each statement at each variable a state the object is actually in. And then you basically propagate these states through the program. We've also evaluated synchronized pushdown system with this type state analysis and compared it to the version from Uppsala 2017. And here are the results. So we evaluated on the Takapo benchmark suite, and um, which, is a, which contains real world programs, for instance, Eclipse and some other ones. And we took three type state property, the file input output type set property that checks that every input and output stream is eventually closed. Then the vector property that checks that you have to add an element before you retrieve anything from a an vector. And the third property was iterator that you have to call um, has next before any next call. And so the green bars here is the version that were that's still using access graphs, and the yellow version is the same analysis just performed with synchronized pushdown systems. And um, here you see that in most of the cases, the analysis with synchronized pushdown system outperformed the old version with access graphs. And also observe that the x-axis here, they represent uh, the analysis time of one object in seconds. And these are logarithmic scale. Well, and then we, um, to just to summary, so we observed speed ups of 1.8 times for vector property and um, up to 83 times on the iterator property. There are also some reasons why the speed up is not as large as, um, as with it for, it, for vector. These details are in the paper. One important, more important thing that the performance is here, that we actually um, observed that the results that we performed were equally precise with both with the access graph and the synchronized pushdown system. And here it's important to understand that the access graph analysis 
does not perform um, the analysis on two independent paths, but on just one path. And because the, the, the results were equally precise, we, we say that we couldn't find this over, it means that we couldn't find this over approximation in practice. To conclude my talk, I have presented synchronized pushdown system that consists, consists of two pushdown systems that interact independently. The pushdown system of call and the pushdown system of field. We, we observed in, um, in a benchmark that the analysis is as, as, price, as, as precise as k-limiting without any k-limit, while it's almost as, precision, as efficient as uh, an analysis with a k-limit of 1. And also we couldn't observe any over-approximation in practice for typeset analysis. Thank you. So we'll start off with Slido. Can you, for any given instance, check if your over approximation is not really an over approximation and the results are actually correct? In practice. So I have difficulty in understanding that. Can, could you read? So I think the question is, if you run your analysis yes. and you get a result, yes. is there a way to, to check. then check if you did an over approximation? Thing is, then you have to somehow capture the data flow path inside the results, and that's what we don't do because of efficiency. We could somehow also track the statements that were relevant, and then you could compare: is there any difference in that? So there would be a way. Yes. You have an undecidable problem. Yes. You split it in two by uh, first ignoring all tests, then doing a Cartesian abstraction in two, on one side the cold and on the one side the field that are no longer re related. Mm -hmm. And then you say we make no over approximation. In practice. Uh, yeah, so it's in the abstract. <laughs> yes. And so why do you insist to reduce to two decidable programs? Maybe keeping the original link would give more precise and faster analyzers with some kind of widening. So, how would you keep how would you keep these analyses together? I mean, then you, what you say is that you would li would would keep an undecidable problem undecidable, and just say there is no program where it ever happens. an interesting way. I haven't thought of it yet. But then... <laughs> but I would rather have a decidable algorithm than an undecidable one. <laughs> Thank you. So, uh, hi, over here. Maybe uh, as a follow-up question, um, there was a paper actually in Popple 2000, um, yeah, 2017 where um, they actually uh, solve the same kind of technical problem using linear conjunctive uh, language reachability, mm -hmm. which is really an undesignable problem, and then they over approximate it. So I think it's really what yeah. Patrick was on. And have you compared, or do you know of the approach? I, I know the approach. We haven't yet compared to it, but it's something they take really the language perspective of the problem, and I would like to further on elaborate on that, definitely. Yeah. Then we have another question from Slido. Is there a more intuitive way to understand SPDS, for example, by stating that some restrictions are put on the push-pop actions of the two push-down systems? So for me, the best intuition was really that I have these that we have these two context-free language reachabilities, and we just say the one system just consists of one language and the other one just consists the other one. That's the best intuition I have so far for it. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Then let's thank the speaker. <laughs>